Our reading this evening, 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. 2 Peter 1, verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Forever lacks these qualities, is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for this word from your servant, the Apostle Peter. We pray, Father, that you help us to learn in our own lives how to increase in these qualities, how to have them so that we uh, may not be ineffective or unfruitful in the service of our Lord. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have in him and for the hope that we have in him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right. By the time that this series is done, you'll probably have this passage memorized. Increasing in steadfastness is the next intuitive step after increasing in self-control. We might think of steadfastness as self-control lasting as long as it needs to. The New Testament almost always talks about steadfastness in terms of affliction. In fact, there's only one place in the New Testament that uses this, this word um, in the sense of patience, as in forbearing with another person. And in, not in a, a way that really bears on, on us and our day-to-day -day walk in the faith. Uh, otherwise... All across the New Testament, this particular word that Peter's using here, translated steadfastness, is always used uh, to talk about lasting through trials with our eyes on the prize. Now, we talk about this a lot. In fact, we just finished up a whole series on endurance, on patiently awaiting the Lord's coming. So I don't want to rehash all of the things that we have just been talking about over the past month. Um, instead, I'm going to limit my comments tonight to a couple of pieces of practical advice for how to increase in steadfastness. Now, we are going to start with some familiar passages, though. James chapter 1, verse 2, is probably the most well-known passage on endurance James chapter 1, verse 2, James writes, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So we know the content of this passage, that the trying of our faith produces endurance or steadfastness. James is not the only one to tell us this. I want us to consider another passage. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 
I mean, notice the way that Paul structures this is very similar to the way that Peter was structuring his list. It's like we've got a step ladder here. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame. So if we're looking for those good results, if we are looking to have a strong character that places, if we're looking to place our hope in God, then it begins with, well, not with endurance, not with steadfastness. It begins, actually, with suffering. All right, but I want us to consider something here about the relationship between self-control and steadfastness or endurance. We often think of self-control as just restraint. Uh, in fact, I largely focused on it in those terms last week when we were looking at some other passages. We talked about saying no to ourselves. All right, so I see something that I want, and I teach myself to say no to myself. Um, and that particularly is useful for when we're dealing with temptation. Because remember the way that James talks about sin. Sin begins as desire, right, that entices us and leads us astray. So self-control is about learning to say no to that, throwing on the brakes, as it were. But there's a different type of self-control that we must also master. And it is standing up when we would rather lay down. Or continuing on when we would rather give up and quit. And when we get good at that kind of self-control, then we are growing in what Peter calls steadfastness. It's, it's the kind of self-control that, honestly, the, the best earthly example that I have of it um, is in running. Uh, especially if you're out of condition and you're going back into long distance running for the first time in a while, you will hit a point where your body is just telling you, please stop, <laughs> please, please just let me stop. And you ha it's a very difficult mental decision that you have to make because realistically your body is actually nowhere close to being done. Your body has way more juice left in it than what it is telling you. Like we, we know that as a scientific fact. It's just the dumb part of your brain signaling you, hey, this is, I don't like this. Please just quit this. And one of the big hurdles that you have to get over in doing any kind of distance running is learning to say no to that part of your brain. So it is saying no to yourself in one sense, but it's forcing yourself to continue when you would rather stop. It is forcing yourself to keep going and not to quit over the course of not just one occasion, but many successive occasions of some part of you telling yourself, I want to quit. And it's just you constantly saying, no, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep going. That physically is, and mentally is steadfastness. Peter is encouraging us to have a spiritual equivalent to that. So to practice steadfastness, uh, and you could probably tell that the running example was going in this direction. Uh, but Paul says, and James says, that endurance, steadfastness, good character, hope, the beginning point for those things is suffering. To practice steadfastness and to increase in steadfastness, we must have something that we are standing up to. Something where we're having to push ourselves to continue on. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Those are James's words. Trial is a high-stakes, high-reward proposition. Because when we are tried, there's a chance that we will fail. If you, you go out on a distance run, there is a chance that you will bonk. That's the technical term for it in the running community. You will bonk, and you will bonk hard. There's even a chance that you, if your form gets really sloppy, you'll end up injuring yourself. 
But if you keep at it and you keep doing it well, well then you get a little bit more in shape. And you keep doing that over and over until you get in much better shape. Trial, similarly, is a high-stakes, high-reward proposition. When we are tried, there's the chance that we will that we'll fail. And failure, in, in this case, we're talking about sin. But what James and Paul both tell us is that this is the beginning point for, for growth in endurance, is being tried. There is no growth without being tried. So the first piece of practical advice that I have is not to live for avoiding trials. Sometimes life provides us, in fact, I think it's fairly often, life provides us with choices where there's an easy way and a hard way. And sometimes we need to pick the hard way simply because it is the hard way. And for no other reason. We just look at something as if here, this is the harder way to do it. I'm going to do it this way and just make myself do it. I'm reminded of the story of Boaz. Consider Boaz in the book of Ruth. Very little of what Boaz does in the book of Ruth is, some, is required of him by the law. This is kind of a big deal with Boaz's character. Right, what's required of him is that he allow Ruth to glean in the fields um, and that he leave a, you know, the, the fringe of the field available for gleaning. That's really all that the law requires of him. Uh, the law doesn't require any of the other things that he does. It uh, doesn't require him to go through all of the trouble of having his, his servants uh, look after her or go, after the tr go through the trouble of having them toss extra grain out on the ground, especially not the trouble of actually going himself to hunt down the other redeemer and force the issue on Ruth's behalf. Boaz would have been well within his rights to just send Ruth out by herself to pursue her claim with the other Redeemer and just kind of let the chips fall wherever. But Boaz took an active hand in things himself and accepted a lot of obligation onto himself. Right, by taking Ruth, uh, by redeeming Ruth, he put his own inheritance at risk. Now, if you pay attention for it in your own life, it, it won't be something as dramatic as a widow shows up at your door and wants to glean in your fields. <laughs> but if you pay attention for it, you will notice these kinds of easy way, hard way choices in your life, especially in the modern age where we have so many options. One of, the, one of the great things about modernity, one of the great things about the wealth that we have made for ourselves, is it gives us lots of outs from things. We can foresee some trouble coming and dodge out of the way. But let me encourage you not to, to build your life around ducking trouble all the time. Right? Because steadfastness grows under trial. You've got to let some trial in. We talked last week in, ta in considering self-control um, that we have to be discerning. Uh, sometimes the best way to practice self-control and to increase in self-control is to pace yourself, to actually avoid circumstances where you would have to practice self-control if you see that they are beyond you um, or that you have you've kind of reached your limit a bit. Um, well, the flip side of that, th that same process of discernment uh, says that you have to be able to, to look at your life and acknowledge when you are not exposing yourself to enough trouble, making yourself work hard enough. Again, the, the, the comparison I keep returning to is exercise and running. You have to know how to pace yourself. You know, if, you, if you only go out and run a thousand meters one day a week for the rest of your life, 
nothing's going to change. That's a minuscule amount of running. You're not running enough. If you go out and say, I'm going to run a 10K every day, and I've not run in like five years, hey, that's way too much. You have to discern right, what's, where's the pace that I need to be. The same thing goes with trial. We need to discern not just what is too much, but what is too little, and when we need to push ourselves a little bit harder. The other piece of practical advice that I have comes from the book of Hebrews. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Now, well, we'll finish the chapter here. All these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. I want to stop here for just a second. You consider everything that the Hebrew writer is writing about. Spiritually, this is the stuff that makes you scream out to yourself in your head, I want to quit. Please let me quit. And what we find from the examples of all the saints is that they didn't quit. And this is the point that the Hebrew writer gets at in chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I only had us go through the tail end of Hebrews 11. Oh, we remember the general contents of the chapter, even beyond what we just read, about the way that our forebears in the faith conducted themselves in the faith and the difficulties that they had to go through. Man, pay special attention to what the Hebrew writer says about our relationship to these people. They are a great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us with their examples of faith. That's what they're bearing witness to. What does fidelity to God look like? And the result for us should be that surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, with so many people providing us the examples of what it looks like to endure in the faith, we ought to endure in the faith. Right? Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's a consequence of knowing the lives of all of these people, is that it equips us to live similar lives. Paul says something similar in Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. 
And sometimes we might ask ourselves why so much of the scriptures are recorded in stories rather than in precepts and propositions. The approved examples of scripture are not, they're not just laid down for us to determine what is necessary and what is acceptable in the faith. They are also, beyond that, set down in order to teach us how to endure and to encourage us in our endurance. That as we are going through the struggles of our life, we can look back at dozens of examples of people in all walks of life, you know, from paupers to kings, the whole gamut of people going through the travails of this life, trying to remain faithful to God. And we can see how they did it. We can see where they stumbled. We can see how they reacted. We can see how they were restored. We can see how they endured. And they, they ran a race. Well, actually, they're, in some ways, their race is similar to ours. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. In other words, it, it, the Hebrew writer is telling us they didn't live to see the Messianic age. Like they were living in that expectation. We want to see the Messiah come. When did their race end in their life? It didn't. It lasted all the way to the grave for all of them. And our race is similar. There's, there's no finish line except the last one. So, as we study the scriptures, right, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you to do this in your in your own personal study. As you study the scriptures, keep your eye on this in particular. How did faithful men and women of old overcome the trials that were set before them? All right, study the scriptures specifically with that in mind. Go looking specifically for answers to that question. How did the faithful men and women of old overcome the trials that were set before them? How did they endure now, in some cases, the answer is they didn't, not very well, uh, or they fell off and had to be set back up again. Um, there's, there's a reason why the scriptures present us that kind of story so many times, by the way. But tonight, I want to encourage everyone to embrace hardship and to learn from our ancestors in the faith so that we may grow in steadfastness so that we may not be ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, who himself endured the cross, despising the shame. We urge everyone this evening to get, uh, get on the road to salvation, get on the road to glory. If you have not obeyed the gospel, we urge you to do that tonight. This is the only time that we are given. The only time that we are guaranteed is now. So we urge you to believe the good news, turn away from sin, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of sins. If you need to obey the gospel for the first time, or if you have any other need, uh, we invite you to make that need known to us by coming forward as together we stand and sing.